Hi everyone, welcome to our Domestic Shipping 101 webinar. Uh, we hope that you find some valuable information in our webinar today. I know that a lot of you guys are from the international world and speak international, so we're gonna teach you how to speak domestic today. Let's talk a little bit about Scarborough. Scarborough's been in business since 1984, and we can handle every kind of freight you can think of, find a solution for you, and really be your global and domestic trade uh, service provider. So don't hesitate to contact us. Today we've got Tony Harrelson with us. He is the guru and uh, the domestic transportation manager for Scarborough. And he will be teaching us uh, what we need to know. Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna start with our agenda here. We're gonna touch on the different modes. Then we're gonna go into some quoting requirements, what we need in order to give you an accurate quote. And then we'll get into classifying the freight and uh, in, in quoting, and then we'll get into the hours of service and the ELDs that we've all been hearing so much about. So our modes of transportation, let's start with uh, the truckloads. So truckloads are gonna be predominantly your, your full shipments, up to 26 pallets. Uh, they can be maxing out somewhere around 43 to 44,000 pounds. And quotes are often uh, gonna be reflective of the market trends and available capacity in your area. Next up down from that is going to be your volume shipments. So these are going to be your shipments that are uh, more than your standard LTL, but not quite your full truckload. Here we're going to be looking at uh, shipments with six pallets or more, uh, usually more than 5,000 pounds, and we'll take up somewhere between 12 and 32 linear feet of your trailer. Uh, these quotes will be shipment uh, specific. Uh, the rates will be good for this shipment only and they are uh, good usually for a week. And then we have our standard LTL shipments. These are gonna be your shipments that are uh, one to five pallets and under 5,000 pounds total. Uh, these will come from our rate tariffs and um, coverage on these is usually pretty good as long as we know a shipment is uh, ready to go and can get it called in. Usually by uh, one o'clock, chances are we can probably get it picked up the same day. Okay, so um, just coming from the international side, truckload is the same as a full truckload, an FTL shipment. Correct, correct. Okay. And when it says not always guaranteed, what does that mean? So when we're looking uh, for coverage on a truckload shipment, we can quote it one or two ways. We can quote it with truck in hand or just supply a quote based on the market. So for uh, supplying a quote based on the market, there isn't a specific truck reserve for that shipment. The time when recording it, we're still gonna to have to go out uh, after winning the bid and getting a driver to cover that load. So that means that our rate could possibly change. Uh, we do everything we can to stay within our quote and our quote should uh, still be good unless we fall in some unusual circumstances. Okay, and then what is the, di the difference between like a volume shipment and a density-based shipment. Okay, so density reply, re, uh, applies to what the commodity is. So it's not a mode of transportation, where the volume is a mode of transportation, it's the size of the shipment. Um, it's kind of that middle ground between the truck and the LTL where density which refers to a specific uh, type of commodity. How easy is it to get a truck if you have a volume shipment versus an LTL or truckload? So volume will kind of go along with the LTL. Uh, those are gonna be uh, shipments performed by your LTL carriers. Uh, they just, we get special rating on those um, since they are a larger size. And, uh, but availability should be about the same as it is for an LTL shipment. Okay, uh, would it make sense ever to split up? If I had a volume shipment, would it make sense to split it up into two different LTL shipments? Possibly. Uh, that is something we'd have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I think I've asked enough questions That's on okay. this slide. Okay, next we're looking at what is required for a quote. So let's start with LTL. Uh, the items in red are the critical ones. We need to know the origin and destination zip codes. Uh, knowing just the cities is uh, usually not enough. They will all ask for the actual zip codes. We need to know the number of pieces shipping 
And that is referring to the uh, handling units, not necessarily the number of boxes on a pallet. Um, how is it packaged? Is it loose or palletized or crated? Uh, what is the freight class? If you know that, that is helpful. If not, if we have a good description of what the commodity is, we can look it up in the NMFC and, uh, and find out what the freight class is. Also, if you're gonna have any special loading or delivery requirements, does your origin or destination require lift gates? Uh, any limited access facilities such as a school, church, uh, shopping center, uh, military base, uh, farm, these are all locations that uh, will uh, include a limited access fee. Uh, also, residential is another thing we need to know up front, or a trade show. These are all uh, requirements that will affect the rate. Then on the uh, full truckload side, uh, again, same thing, origin and destination, zip codes, so we know uh, where we're starting and stopping from. And then uh, the transit time requirements. Uh, on this shipment, is standard transit going to be enough, or uh, are you going to need team service? Keep in mind with all the uh, new uh, mandates out there, we need to make sure we're taking that into effect. The commodity, we need to know what we're uh, moving. Uh, we need to find out if it's hazmat or uh, requires any kind of special endorsements. Uh, the weight, and then uh, any uh, requirements at the delivery end. Is it gonna be an appointment? Is it gonna be first come, first serve? Um, when do they receive? Is it a night receiver only, day receiver? All those play into uh, when we uh, get the rate. Okay, so classifying the LTL shipments. So when we're classifying LTL shipments, the, uh, the LTL carriers use uh, what they call the NMFC. And the NMFC goes in and classifies freight into 18 different classes, ranging from uh, 50 to 500. Generally speaking, the uh, lower your freight class, the lower your cost. Also, freight classifications, the way they kind of determine their classes, are gonna be based on density, value, the ease of handling, uh, the stowability, and also the uh, liability of theft or damage to the article. If it's easily damaged, if it's a uh, high value, uh, you're gonna see a higher freight class. Um, yeah, so I was gonna ask, why is classifying freight so important? Okay, so the LTL carriers use the NMFC guide to determine their rates. So the rate tariffs are all based off the class of the freight. So you have to know what the class of the freight is in order to uh, get the rate. Uh, it's not like some of the international shipments which are purely based on uh, the density of an item. So they actually go by the classification of the item. Okay, and, and the lower the freight class, the, the lower the cost normally. Generally, the lower the cost, yes. And does the NMFC class have to do anything with the HTS number on like the inbound side of things? It's a similar uh, classification. Um, just like you would have to classify over there, we would have to classify for domestic shipments in the NMFC. So basically there's three different numbers that we classify <laughs> by. We do NMFC for domestic. Right. We do HTS for imports, U.S. imports, and then there's a Schedule B number for U.S. exports. So yes. So all there's three different all three classifications, could, huh? Could be in play on a given shipment. Yes. Okay, interesting. So is the when you're classifying LTL, um, can you use the same NMFC class if it is in a full truckload and it's the same commodity? So when you're dealing with truckload, the class doesn't really matter because you're um, reserving the whole you have the whole trailer so it's just you're uh, you're basically purchasing the trailer for the whole it's trailer. just a truckload just rate a truck and the nmfc rate. number does not matter correct for okay. truckload that's purely an ltl uh, necessity okay interesting okay our density based items there are certain commodities out there that the nmfc breaks down their classification based on how dense they are uh, the more dense the item uh, the lower the freight class, which then in turn normally means a lower cost. Um, then if you have a more fragile or bulky item, 
those are going to tend to fall into your higher freight classes, which are going to give you a higher class. And here we have the formula on how we determine what the density of a specific item is. What we need to know is what is the length, width, and height of the greatest dimension. So if it does overhang the pallet, then we need that dimension. If it doesn't overhang, then the pallet would be the dimension. Uh, so those are given in inches. We then divide that by 1728. That is how many inches in a cubic feet, or in a cubic foot rather, and that will give us our cubic foot. Our cubic feet. Weight, uh, then we take the weight and divide it by the cubic feet, and that'll give us our pounds per cubic feet, which we'll see in the next slide. Here's an example where we use that formula. So here we have an example of some plastic sleds. Let's say we have one pallet that measures 48 by 40 and is 30 inches tall and weighs 474 pounds. If we run that formula, we see that it's going to have a uh, pounds per cubic feet of 14.22. If we take that uh, same uh, pallet and it stacks 60 inches tall and weighs 500 pounds, and it's, let's say, the same commodity, now we're looking at pounds per cubic feet of 7.5. One thing to keep in mind is always important to include the weight of your pallet or Rate when uh, when giving the weight because those are part of the calculations. So you're so 7.5 PCF. What is that going to? How's that going to be used in the formula for classifying? Like how is is this 7.5 number a a lower? Is it going to lead to a lower classification number or higher? Yeah, that's what we're going to see on the next slide here. So okay. so we have a. So on the front, let's go ahead and tamp down. So now we have, on the first example, we have 14.22 pounds per cubic feet, which in this example would equal out to be a class 85. Uh, the second example was 7.5 pounds per cubic feet, and that's a class 125. So if you come down here on the chart, and you look in here where it says 14.22 uh, would fall into sub nine, which is gonna be a class 85. And on the other one, it was 7.5, so it's going to be a sub 4, and that would be a class 125. So that's where you see your classification come in. So when I'm packing my material, I really need to consider that it might change the class. Yes, it could change the class. And typically, would we say if we stack it high or lower? It all depends on the weight. That's the It depends part. on the yeah. weight. So it all works out into whatever your pounds per cubic feet are. Okay. So if it's a, if it's really lightweight and stacked tall, it's still going to be a higher class than if it's more dense. Okay. Interesting. So basically what you're telling me is we just need to think about different solutions. If we're wanting to lower our classes mm -hmm. and lower our freight options, lower our costs, if we can think about the packing and really become an engineer for a minute and change the way that we pack the goods. You could, yes. If you could get your uh, your pounds per cubic feet down, um, I mean up rather, you would uh, you would lower your class, yes. Okay, very interesting. All right. Next, quoting CBMs. This is something that uh, is brought to us a lot uh, with the international shipments uh, especially. So a lot of times when uh, Seems when we get quote requests in, they are for an international shipment. All is known, all that we know is the uh, cubic meters. Uh, the short answer is yes, we can use that to quote, but it need, everybody needs to keep in mind that is purely an estimate. Uh, and we'll, as we go through this example, we can see why. So we're, uh, if we look at this example that we have here, um, we have 41 pieces coming in. We know the total weight and we know how many cubic meters that the particular shipment is taking up. But what we don't know is how big they actually are. Uh, we don't know if they're oversized. We don't know if they're just long. So for, for the sake of quoting, we're gonna assume that they're on a standard sized pallet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, the cubic meters and convert that over to cubic feet. And then we're gonna take that cubic feet and we're going to divide it by 93. Now 93 is an estimated uh, max 
uh, density for a standard 40 by 48 that's stacked roughly 48 inch, 84 inches tall. So you divide that 93 into the 244 and you come up with needing roughly three pallets to quote that shipment on. Okay, so something that Scarborough does provide out on our website is a tool that basically can do this for you. So um, if you guys are like me and horrible at math, you don't have to do this yourself. Um, so we'll be sending that out um, with the presentation and add a link in the our YouTube video for that. But it's just a, a simple domestic calculator that you can throw in your cubic meter size and it will calculate um, what you need in order to uh, quote for domestic purposes. And then you can use that information and send it to our domestic team to get a rate. So it, it will definitely shorten the length of time that, it, that you can get a quote back and um, help you in the long run. All right, so as we're quoting from these, as we said earlier, we were estimating that these were on standard pallets. Okay, and in that uh, same estimate, we were assuming that we could stack it 84 inches tall. So what happens if that isn't the case? So let's say after it comes in, it uh, comes off the container and it's packaged for shipping, and we find out that uh, these uh, 41 cases aren't going to fit onto the three skids. Um, let's say that they can only be stacked 40 inches tall for for whatever the the reason is. So now our estimate that we did earlier for three pallets is actually turned into six pallets. And what this is gonna cause us to do is have to go out and get a volume price uh, for the shipment. Since we are now over that uh, five pallet limit, we were always gonna compare LTL and volume pricing uh, with something in the six pallet range. Um, your rate is probably gonna go up because you have more freight shipping out. And, um, so anytime you're looking at a uh, CBM quote, we need to be mindful of this. Also, the other thing we don't know just by looking at CBMs is how long or tall an object is. It doesn't tell us if it's gonna be uh, 10 feet long, 11 feet long. And a lot of the carriers are adjusting their, ex uh, what they call excess length accessorial. It uh, is becoming shorter. Some of them have reduced it down to eight feet. So anything that's longer than eight feet is going to be assessed in the extra accessorial fee for its uh, length. So what you're telling me is, let's say that I've got an LCL shipment from overseas, um, throwing it in Scarborough's consolidation, it's coming from Shenzhen direct to Kansas City, and they tell me that it's, uh, I don't know, three cubic meter. Okay. And from that, we can, do the calculations, make the assumption. I, you probably have something, a good idea of what that would be on a standard pallet. Yeah. But if they packed it extremely high, or if it's overhanging the pallet, then that's going to significantly change my rate. So what I'm asking is, it's not easy to get a rate until you actually have the freight here in your warehouse. In your warehouse and with accurate dimensions. Once we have the accurate dimensions, then we give an accurate rate. So even though we can estimate a rate off of cubic meter, there is a good chance that it will change. It will change, yes. Okay. yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so when do we use full truckload or truckload service? Um, obviously, if it's gonna fill your trailer, if it's gonna be 26 or up around the let's say 20 to 26 skids, uh, it's gonna be probably over 15 to 20,000 pounds, you're probably getting into that truckload area. Uh, some volume shipments can handle that weight of around 15,000 pounds, it just really would depend on your pallet count. Uh, truckload service uh, can be more cost effective sometimes on than your larger volumes. It's gonna depend on the, uh, the market and in what's going on in the specific lane at the time. Your volume shipments, uh, if you have a deadline, you may not want to go volume, you may want to look at truckload service just because of the faster transit time. Uh, even though it's a volume shipment, you're still with an LTL carrier, you're still going to have to go through their hubs. Uh, where the truckload shipment, you're going to go from point A to point B. 
Is a truckload service the same as a dedicated truck? In the truckload, yes. Unless you've identified up front that it, it is a partial, yes, you have the entire truck. And what's the difference between a dedicated truck and like a hotshot truck? So when, uh, when we refer to hotshots, we're often referring to straight trucks or a sprinter van, or you could possibly even have a regular uh, 53, but maybe with a team that's, that uh, will be able to move continually through the, uh, through the day where they don't have the hours of service restrictions because they can just switch drivers. Okay. Um, I, I think another, and you correct me if I'm wrong, another use for a truckload service would be if um, your, your customer or your warehouse doesn't have a dock door or um, they don't accept containers or it's really hard for it to get a container in there. Um, a lot of times I've seen where we've had to transload in a warehouse from a container into a truckload. Is that true? Yes, that can, uh, as far as speeding up your service, that can happen, yes. So and when your container comes in, if it's a full container that's coming inland, uh, it may be quicker to break it, have it unloaded, and put onto a truck to come out. Um, you figure you're on average, a single driver can do roughly 500 miles a day as an average, where your team can, uh, can run pretty much nonstop, except for the fueling and, and necessity stops that they have. So a team can keep moving. So yes, that can speed up your transit time uh, versus it coming on the rail from the coast. Let's say that I um, had a shipment coming in from the coast um, and it was routed only to the coast, but I need to get it inland. Um, you know, from what I understand, a dray is extremely expensive. If, if you can even find a drayman, that's right. going to bring that container over state lines. So another use would be to transload that in a warehouse and onto a full truckload. Yes, most definitely. And then uh, the last thing is, if you're uh, looking at this, is uh, is your product uh, product fragile? Uh, do you have a high potential for damage? Uh, truckload freight it's going to be loaded once, once at the shipper, once at the receiver. Uh, where with your LTL or volume shipment, you're going to be going through the hubs. It's going to be unloaded, go through the terminal, loaded back onto another trailer. So just more handling, more opportunities for for damage. What, what kind of measures do you take um, so that way your product is not damaged inside a truck? Uh, as far as packaging is going to be the biggest thing. So on the shipping end, make sure it's packaged correctly. Uh, make sure it's secured to the pallet or if it's crated, make sure the crate is sturdy. Um, make sure everything uh, is sufficient. Uh, if it's something that shouldn't be stacked, and we, if we know that up front, if it's an LTL or volume shipment, we can put on there, do not stack, uh, to eliminate any uh, potential damage there. In containers, um, they do the, the whole block and brace. Mm -hmm. and do you do that with full truckload? Full truckload, they can block and brace as needed. Also, uh, the, uh, a lot of the drivers will have load locks or straps, so uh, they, that's another method of securement that they can use, is their straps and bars. All right, so here's some more things to consider when quoting a full truckload. Uh, rates are often transactional. Uh, we can do contractual if uh, we know that we're going to have a certain volume uh, over a certain amount of time. We can definitely look into contractual uh, situations. Um, the availability of capacity. This is something that's uh, really being uh, brought to the service right now with everything that's going on. Uh, so you are kind of restricted to the available capacity at the time when your shipment is ready to go in whatever market they may be. If there's a larger demand than there is equipment, then that will drive up the rate sometimes. Uh, the other thing to look at is load requirements. Um, will this affect the rates? Uh, so if you have a hazmat shipment or a tanker endorsement, these are all things that can affect the rate. Uh, hazmat is a special endorsement drivers need as well as tanker so um, there is not as many of them out there so they do come at a premium as well as your team drivers um, it costs more for team service than it would this regular single service what if I have a specific window of time or hours of operation for my warehouse does that affect my rate it can let's say your warehouse is only a night receiver um, that sometimes can affect your rate because it just kind of messes up the, 
the planning and the normal flow of a driver's day, they have to wait around and do a uh, do an evening delivery. Um, when, we, when we quote uh, truckload capacity, uh, is not always guaranteed. Now, unless we're quoting what we call truck in hand, which would mean uh, securing the, the driver up front and then getting the rate approved and moving forward from there versus quoting based off market and then finding the truck uh, after the intended load. Here is an equipment guide for your standard dimensions on a 53 dry van and a 53 reefer. Uh, you'll notice that your inside dimensions are just a little bit shorter on the length. Uh, the width is a good thing to notice. Sometimes people want to know if we can load our van or a reefer. Uh, the biggest thing there is to notice is your inside width. The reefers tend to be a little narrower than the dry vans due to the insulation they have there in the walls. Also, the uh, height can be uh, a little different with the reefer sometimes. Sometimes reefers will have chutes that run down the ceilings of the trailer to help uh, route the air back for better circulation. If these are a fixed chute and not a fabric chute, sometimes they can't be removed and it does restrict your inside height. So if you have something that's stacked high, that can be impacted. Uh, the weights, reefers usually can't scale as much as dry vans, they're pretty close. Uh, the main reason for this is the weight of the unit on the front of the trailer as well as the fuel tank underneath. And then uh, 26 pallets is your standard amount of uh, pallets that you can fit on the floor in a van and reefer. So this is just a, sta a standard van. Are yes. there other sizes as well? There are a few. 48s have kind of been phased out. You might still see some 48s out there somewhere. Um, but not very often. Pretty much in the uh, van and reefer uh, area, this is pretty much the standard now. Uh, when you get into flatbeds and the specialized equipment, it, it can vary a little bit more, but, uh, but speaking with dry vans and reefers, this is kind of your standard now. If I packed my full container full of product, no extra room, would it fit in a 53 foot? Would the product fit in there? Well, a lot of that is going to depend on how how tall it is. I mean, if you're if it fits, then yes. But the the most biggest, of the time, does it spill over? What do you mean by spilling over? Like, do I have to get LTL to oh. take the rest of the shipment? As long as everything will fit in there, then you should be fine. As long as you're not stacked higher than your inside height, then you should be okay. Okay. All right, the ELDs or electronic logging devices. This is something that's been on the news a lot here lately. Um, so what are the ELDs? The ELDs require that the truck drivers use an electronic logging device to monitor their driving hours. These LODs are gonna be there to verify that the drivers are adhering to the current hours of service. In the past, uh, they could use paper logs, uh, which didn't have the same uh, accuracy as the ELDs will have. ELDs are connected to the uh, truck's onboard computer or diagnostic system, so they know when the truck is actually moving versus sitting still. Along with the logging device that's attached to the truck, it also ensures, as we mentioned earlier, that the accuracy of the uh, logging. So what's, what's the hype with the ELD? You know, they're saying that it's putting trucking companies out of business. You know, why is that? So there's a couple of factors. One, there is a cost associated with it. They are gonna have to purchase the device um, and the software to go uh, to with it. Um, some drivers aren't wanting to make the change over. Um, so they're, not, they're probably just going to leave the market and not drive anymore. So those are going to be your two biggest factors and um, just the way that uh, they're being monitored now. They have to, uh, to log it the way they're actually driving. Has, have the hours of service, it, service requirements actually changed or this just really enforces them? Correct. So the hours of service have not changed uh, here in the last couple of months. It's just the enforcement method to monitor them. 
So the electronic logging device or the ELD mandate, what will be the uh, impact of the ELDs and what can, can be done? As far as the drivers, once the driver's day is started, he or she cannot stop the clock. Uh, the time spent waiting or sitting in a dock uh, potentially could be taken away from their driving time. Also, uh, pre-planning and time management is going to become more important for the drivers and their dispatchers. And then lastly, the term driver-friendly freight is going to be uh, probably start to be heard more and more. Um, facilities to get drivers in and out quickly are, are going to be those driver-friendly uh, locations. Uh, as far as customers, the transit time needed to transport your goods is now under tighter control. And how much time the driver spends on average at your facility uh, is probably your biggest role in the uh, situation. So if uh, the driver is sitting there waiting for a dock on a busy day or just waiting to, uh, to be loaded, that's time that could potentially be taken away from their driving. So the biggest thing you can do is shorten the amount of time that the drivers are there to be loaded or unloaded. Is this just for over the road drivers or is this for local drivers as well? It applies to all drivers. Um, it's probably impacting the over the road guys more than it is the, the local drivers. Uh, their days still start and stop pretty much at the same times. They do have a factor in their days as well, but the biggest impact is going to be seen on the over the road. What happens if a driver is 30 minutes or, I mean, even three minutes from, is there a grace window, you know, from the delivery point and the hours of, regu hours of service regulation? That's a, that's a sticky question. Uh, technically, uh, when their time's up, their time's up. Um, now, I think they are allowed to get to a safe spot. Obviously, if they're in the middle of a highway, they're allowed to get to a safe spot. But other than that, uh, when your time's up, your time should be up. Um, do like box trucks with lift gates, do they fall under this mandate as well? Any commercial vehicle that's transporting property will be affected. So here's our, here's a quick summary kind of of the hours of service. Uh, we have a uh, 14 hour dry, uh, day limit. So once a driver's day starts, they have 14 consecutive hours to complete their duties for the day. Uh, 11 hours of that can be driving, that's the maximum, and that can only be taken if they've had 10 consecutive hours off duty prior to that. Uh, a driver must also uh, have a uh, rest break at least 30 minutes each day um, by the time they get the end of their eight hours. So the drivers do have to take a 30 minute break at some point during their day. And then they have to get in the 10 hour break, uh, eight of which has to be in the sleeper berth. And then they can have two other hours uh, consecutively that uh, can either be in the sleeper berth or off duty. But they just have to be, uh, that, those two have to be consecutive as do the eight. And does this play into effect uh, why there's such a driver shortage? What are the other factors of why there's such a driver shortage right now? Uh, a lot of it has to do with the, uh, I call it quality of life, I guess, if you want. Uh, younger, the younger generation isn't wanting to spend their life on the road. They want a more regular schedule where they're home every night. So uh, the over-the-road driver, they're maybe home once every two, three weeks versus being home every night. So that's probably the biggest factor and the reason why uh, – the number of people coming into the profession is not as high as the number that are leaving. And the number that are leaving is, is pretty high right now. Everybody's retiring. That's right. It's, it's really, the average age is, uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was 50 plus is the average age of most drivers on the road. So here's an example of a logbook for a day. So in this example, we can see where he came on duty at midnight. Uh, he was probably doing his pre-trip in this first hour, and then he started driving at 1 a.m. He drove for five hours, then he went uh, off duty for an hour. Uh, then he came back on duty, drove for three more, and 
Then he was on duty again, but not driving for a while. Then he drove, and then his day was over at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And he had to take his 10-hour break. So he met his, his break in the uh, between 6 and 7 a.m. So he was in compliance with uh, the hours of service. You see the dip down here, the on-duty uh, not driving between 10 a.m. and noon. That is a good example of when a driver could have been at a dock uh, if he was unloading his own freight or doing something uh, to that effect. That is time that uh, while he was on duty, he was not he was not driving, and uh, he possibly could have had another hour to drive uh, potentially in this example. So here's one of two days back to back. Uh, in this one, we start out with the driver starting his day at 10. And then um, he comes on duty and does his pre-trip. He drives, uh, he does get his break in there. He went off duty for an hour between four and five. And then he went into the sleep, uh, they went back to driving, pardon me. And until 10 o'clock, he went off duty for a while. And then he went into the sleeper uh, for uh, eight hours. And then he went back off duty again. So that completed his uh, 10 hours. Uh, consecutively than he needed and then he was able to start driving again so then you have the uh, the dip down there for a pre-trip and he started driving and then he went off duty got his break in he had four more hours then some uh, some other on-duty activities he needed to do then he finished up with his driving and off duty again so in this example there weren't any violations and everything was done properly so you know what are what are some things that are really going to affect this? Like, you know, waiting time at airports, weather. Yes. So yeah, any, any time that anything that's causing the driver to have to stop outside of, um, so times at docks, um, times at airports, uh, stopping to fuel, stopping to eat, um, all those things, stopping to use the restroom, any of these things that a driver needs to do uh, throughout his day, uh, if he has to come off that driving line to do it, then that's just time away from uh, being able to drive. And uh, the biggest thing is once they start that clock, uh, the 14 hours, then uh, they can't stop it. And it uh, will be over at the end of 14 hours. Here's one more example where uh, it kind of specifically looks at just the 30 minute break. In the previous examples, he went off to the for, for about an hour, but uh, all that is required is a 30 minute break. So in this one, he came on at 10, uh, went on duty, then started driving for seven. He was on duty two more for not driving. Before he can drive again, he has to take that 30 minute break before he can start driving again. On duty, not driving, and then you have to take a break. So what's he doing? What are examples of so what he's doing? He could be uh, at a facility, he could be loading or unloading his, uh, his trailer that is something that would be on duty but not driving so if he's doing anything that pertains to to work and you know on the truck um, that could be time that's still on duty okay. and now we can open up to any questions well I, I definitely asked a lot of questions and interrupted you throughout this um, does Scarborough classify our domestic NMFC number for us we can yes we can determine your nmfc number if you're if you're unsure of what your nmfc number is uh we can definitely get together just reach out uh we can go over uh, the description of your commodity what it is we can uh we can look it up and, and find out what it is uh, the NMFC guide is available online. It's uh, what it's called Classit. Uh, it's a paid subscription, so you can get it online, or we also have an old-fashioned book that we use as well uh, to classify the freight. What would you say is the most important process to domestic shipping? <clears throat> Getting the information up front in the beginning. So whether it's going to be a truckload or LTL, the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. So getting the um, LTL or volume, getting the dimensions, getting all the requirements that we need to know um, so that we can make the, uh, the best rate. Also on the truckload, knowing everything up front. It's the hidden surprises later on that, that 
affect everybody. And I'm going to add to that, not just the information about the shipment, but what is, where's the shipment going? Is this a hot client for you? Is there a deadline that you have to meet? Are you rate driven? Are you time driven? Um, you know, any information that you can give to your domestic carrier or your domestic broker is going to be helpful because they're working as a partner. Yeah. You know, they're not, at least at Scarborough, we're not just uh, throwing out rates and picking up freight and doing this and that. We are a true partner to our clients. So we need to know all the information we can so we can satisfy your client just as you want to satisfy them. Satisfy them. If your client's happy, then everybody's happy. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question about small parcel. Um, when would it be beneficial to call a domestic broker as opposed to like a UPS or a FedEx for a small shipment? What's that threshold? I would say anytime you're dealing with anything um, that's over 100 pounds or maybe has some um, size to it, if it's long or tall, uh, I would probably have that quoted as a uh, as an LTL shipment as well, and just compare them and see which one is best. Um, it could vary a lot from shipment to shipment, but I would say it would probably be good to compare price and any time you're over 100 pounds. Okay, that's that's a good threshold. I, I think that's the same on the international side. I would say any time that a shipment is 100 pounds on the international side, definitely reach out to a freight forwarder to get a rate. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. We ship quite a bit of our product in 275 gallon totes. Is it necessary for the driver to have tanker endorsement? And is there a maximum weight before tanker endorsement is required? So the biggest requirement on the uh, tankers is anytime it's over 119 gallon per container and it's filled, and you have to have an aggregate volume of 1,000 gallons or more, then you need the tanker endorsement. Does Scarborough handle large equipment, project shipments, um, out of the ordinary type of yes. cargo? Yes, we can handle anything that you have from the, uh, from the large pieces of equipment um, down to your, your small one pallet scale. We can do everything in between. Do you, is there a guide that has different uh, type of equipment such as like gooseneck and out of gauge and yeah so yes there are uh, uh, we kind of have some diagram type things that we can use that show uh, what the uh, dimensions fit best on each type of trailer you start with your standard flatbed then you get down to your step deck down to your double drop then down to your RGNs and then you get really can get spread out for your heavy stuff into the multi-axle so would I need to figure that information out myself? Or if I told Scarborough and gave them a picture of my product, would they be able to tell me what I need? Yeah, if you can give us, uh, pictures are always great. I'm never gonna turn down a picture of, uh, of any kind of freight, uh, but especially with the uh, over-dimensional stuff uh, or just flatbed in general, uh, pictures are great and the dimensions and weight to go along with it and then we can figure out the trailer that's needed. If we're moving over dimensional freight uh, across the nation, do different states have different restrictions? There will be, yeah, each state can have their own variants. They're, they're, they're gonna be similar, but uh, they, you could find some different uh, variances in some states. When is a triaxle needed? When, okay. when I have like an overweight shipment? What, what's the limit? And uh, when do you suggest that I actually order maybe two containers or move it on two truckloads as opposed to getting a triaxle? I think the, uh, on a, as far as on a uh, 20 footer, I think it's somewhere around 36, 37,000 pounds you have to get into the triaxle. On the uh, 40 foot, it's, I think it's somewhere up in the 40,000 pound range you have to, to move up to the triaxle. But can't I wait, uh, pay, just pay an overweight charge and keep stuffing my container that way? Uh, you're still going to have to have, you still have to be able to scale it legally on the road. So uh, so we would advise against that, yeah, right? I would, I would get the proper equipment so it's legal. Okay. 
Government regulations are strangling the shipping industry. Costs are dramatically increasing. Drivers are disappearing. What can a business expect with respect to cost and availability of equipment and personnel to meet their transportation needs? So, so yes, basically with everything that's going on, uh, we are losing drivers. Uh, and uh, we, uh, when the uh, mandates went first into effect, the rates did go up significantly. Um, now, as far as a national average, uh, they have started to come down a little bit each week. Uh, that may or may not be visible. Um, just depends on what lanes you're shipping in uh, in the capacity uh, that is needed in that given market. So uh, overall, we are still, this year over last year, rates are still up considerably. Um, but as far as uh, since the middle of December, they have started to tick down a little bit. So until things finally settle out, I'm sure we'll finally get to a point where things kind of settle in. Um, then we should uh, kind of know where we're going to be. But uh, for now, we're still kind of waiting to see where they're going to, the rates are going to settle out at. Who is responsible for cost of damage due to weather events? Weather, anytime you have a claim, it's going to go through the same claim process. Uh, it'll go to the carrier um, and it will go through the claims process. So uh, even though it's weather related, um, it'll, it's still going to go through the claim process, and uh, it it'll probably vary by uh, each instance, but uh, it could come down to whatever the claims adjusters, you know, determine as they go through it. How does insurance work on the domestic side? I know that on the international side, we have to elect that we want marine cargo insurance. Okay. So if I'm moving just domestically, as solely a, a nationwide domestic shipment, how does that work? Uh, the truckload is the easiest uh, one to explain. Uh, truckload standard is $100,000 per shipment. So, so I immediately get insurance with the it. The carriers automatically are required to carry $100,000 in cargo insurance. So they will have that. When you get to LTL, it gets a little bit hairier. You have, um, you have an item's value, and uh, then you have um, what classification it's in. So uh, the uh, freight class that it's in will often uh, determine um, what it may be insured for standard, with standard shipment uh, with each carrier. Um, the best thing to do is we can look at it, look at the carrier selected, see what insurance level it would be uh, covered at, and see if we need to purchase additional insurance, which we can do if needed. Um, the biggest thing to uh, remember when it comes to claims is um, when you file the claim, you you don't necessarily get the retail value, you get the replacement value of the part. So uh, when you do file the claim, that is what's available. Uh, the other thing that's kind of different is when you get used machinery or used articles. They will uh, often be insured at, at a per pound rate versus uh, maybe what their replacement value is. And that's simply because the carrier can't verify what the working order was of the machinery uh, was before they took possession of it. So uh, used goods often will be insured differently than new goods. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we ship domestically quite a bit, um, but I'm not sure that it's enough that we would be considered a, a good volume client to a carrier. Is it still beneficial for me to go direct to the carriers or is it better if I go to a domestic broker? No, we can still, um, should be able to give you a, a very good uh, and competitive price. Keep in mind that uh, each individual customer may not be bringing a large volume, but collectively all the customers have a high enough volume where we can get the discounts with the LTL carriers. So uh, when we go to get our rates and negotiate our tariffs with them, we can do that collectively with our full uh, you know, capacity that we can bring to them, not just one individual customer. So basically we would be piggybacking with other clients or sharing these negotiated rates with other clients because the volume through a broker would be much higher than if we went to a domestic carrier ourselves. Yes. And we can, the one other option that's out there is uh, if you do have a high volume in a certain lane, we can go out and negotiate lane specific pricing with carriers. That's an option that we have. 
that the carriers will usually look out. So uh, if you do have a high volume lane, um, we can go out and work uh, on your behalf to get lane specific pricing. Uh, what's the normal free time for unloading a shipment? So on the uh, truckload side, the standard is gonna be anywhere between one and two hours. Um, I would say up until about two months ago, it was usually around two hours, uh, but it has, uh, and some carriers have reduced it down to an hour, and that's just because of the uh, current uh, mandates that are out there. So one to two hours uh, would be your normal free time. I think that's it. All right, everybody, thanks so much for coming to our webinar today. Feel free to reach out to our team, and uh, we will definitely help make your job easier. All right. Thank you, everyone.